Most people listen to podcasts to learn something, to be entertained and to walk away feeling inspired, perhaps even educated a bit. Hello, I'm Devo and I'm one of the two hosts of our show, The Little Impolite Podcast. Welcome and thanks for listening. This show is for the expansive, open-minded, creative, whose persistent curiosity towards integrating new information in their lives never stops. Think of it as the free thinkers toolkit for anyone that refuses to enroll in the conformity of all of those around them, instead forging their own paths with fortitude and love. It's that slightly unapologetic conversation with that new friend you just met that sort of wistfully and effortlessly pushes the conversation into spaces that you never expected. It's the deep-hearted conversations with purposeful and thoughtful individuals that have finally figured out their superpowers and are now pouring into it with gusto and love. We're delighted to host these conversations with you that lead us down the conversation well. But watch your step, because most of our guests, and of course, Lisa and I, are a little impolite. Welcome, welcome. I'm Devo, and thank you for listening to today's episode of the Little Impolite Podcast. And sitting next to me is my co-host and partner in crime. Lisa Staff. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. So we've had a couple of shows where we've just gotten on solo, no guests. Uh-huh. And we've got a really exciting new guest coming on today yeah. to talk a little bit about... We have a fancy title, but it really means nothing. Um, really the balance between success and ego mm-hmm. and how to do self-promotion without coming across or coming off as a narcissistic... Narcissistic fill-in-the-blank. It's a mad lip. Yes. And maybe the best thing about this podcast, besides our guest and us having a conversation with him, is that you get to throw in the word hubris. It's a good word. I know. Not used enough. So if you're new to the podcast and you're new to Devo and I, we uh, met actually four or five years ago. We actually met through social media. And a couple of years ago, we started deciding that we wanted to talk into the ethos, create a podcast. Yes, before we continue along, mm-hmm. I would just like to clarify, it wasn't four or five years ago. It was April 4th, 2017, which is roughly almost exactly five years to the day. So Devo and I work together consistently. You're we no are besties. <laughs> we are besties. We are business partners. And we may be in a relationship as well. I heard there's a, a wedding coming up sometime soon. There could be. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> so t- <laughs> Sorry. See what happens when you start a podcast. So, I like that. Green, mm-hmm. green Room Romance. So, thanks for showing up. Ooh, and, that's and, the name of a new show, Green Room Romance. I like that. Well, I like it too, but we just rebranded, so we can't do that too. <laughs> So if you're new to the show, we are glad that you showed up. We like to talk about just about anything that involves mind, body, and business. Anything that we feel captures the essence of a great conversation that we can grow and learn through and improve ourselves as humans. And our business coach told us that we weren't niching down enough on the podcast. So we took it from mind, body, business and reframed it to a much larger, broader perspective <laughs> called a little impolite, which gives us even more flexibility to talk We're about whatever the We're stubborn we children, aren't we? <laughs> so, <laughs> Cynthia, like, mm. thank you. We love you. <laughs> we don't really listen very well. It takes a while to knock it through to us, but hey. Anywho, anyhow, anyway, today's guest, Daryl Evans, he is going to come on to talk uh, about sort of that space. We're all in this pr- self-promotion space, mm-hmm. right? And so how do you come across promoting your business with authenticity and efficacy without sounding like you're just using hubris and self-grandiose promotion all the time? Because I think we all run into it, whether it's we've found that from someone else that they're just posturing and it's so over the top, it's hard to digest, yeah. right? Right. Or we feel ourselves in order to show up on social media or through business and introducing ourselves and networking and stuff that we are pounding our chest a little too much or we're not doing it enough. Mm-hmm. We're not, you know, being showing up in the best way possible and doing our own PR. So what's that happy medium? Yeah. So Daryl knows a thing about promotion. He works in the digital marketing, digital advertising landscape, has a very successful business. He's based out of Las Las Vegas, Nevada. He's going to be joining us today um, a little bit early for him at six o'clock. But we have both been on his show as guests. So he's very eloquent, um, well put together, fun to talk to, Mm -hmm. full of laughs. And I'm excited about having this conversation with him. Me too. 
All right. So if you like the show, you need to do a few things. You need to like us. You need to follow us. And you need to leave us a review after the show. Because we need affirmation. Not only do we need affirmation, but it helps us grow our brand so that yes. we can get more brilliant people like Daryl on the show. If uh, you have any friends that you're thinking, gosh, they need to kind of have some clarity on this issue of where, how do you market yourself without becoming off as being self promotional, grandiose, grandiose, grandstanding, yeah, narcissistic, That's, vain, yeah, keep going, conceited, yeah, yeah, dubious. I can keep going. Okay, cool. Right. <laughs> so if if you have a friend that you think could use this, share it with them. If you just want to share all those great words that Devo said, share that with them too. You can reach out to us if you have any questions. If you would like us to cover anything else, if you want any more information, you can find Devo on his Instagram. He's on it all day, every day. Fusion, Photog. <laughs> Everyone knows the name now. I don't have this when it and comes I, to self-promotion. <laughs> and I'm at least a staff photo. I'm really glad that you could spend some time with us. We know that you have a lot of things on the go, as does everyone now. We are going in so many different ways, and we would love for you to continue listening to our conversations and be part of our family here. Yeah. All right. Enjoy the show. Oh, but wait, that's not it. You have something free to give away. Ooh, good call. Mm. I like how you brought that in. <laughs> if you will wait till the end of the show at the bottom, actually, you can probably just go to the bottom right now. Um, there is a link where you can download in exchange for your email address. We're going to give you a 10 to 12 minute video that we put together on free download on how to have a healthy. Did you say free? Yeah. <laughs> how to have a healthy relationship with social media and still manage your business and manage your life and not just become obsessively overwhelmed with trying to figure it all out. And I think it's 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 a hard thing to get that balance. Everyone is talking about it and has been for the last 10 years of a work-life balance. And then social media becomes a huge player in that. So how do we do that in a healthy way to feel like we're showing up in the right way, but we're not spending all day on social media? What's going to make the impact in the easiest uh, least amount of resistance and us walking away not feeling like a jerk because we spent all day on it. Yeah. Okay. See you on the other side. Where should all I right. start? Where should I start? Well, let's talk about this whole thing because Lisa and I have this conversation on a regular basis and I, I think it's a fascinating topic because we live in this world where we have a plethora of information at our fingertips and most of it is just grandiose self-promotion. And a lot of times, especially with Instagram, which is where our primary sandbox is, all we ever see is get rich quick, half naked women and yoga, yoga stars promoting themselves in a variety of different platforms. And Lisa and I, we use social media quite successfully and we generate a decent amount of revenue from our social media. But truth be told, if we weren't in business and we weren't using it for that platform, you would never hear from me. I, I, don't really like sharing information. And I'm a pretty private dude, and so is Lisa. And so we're always like, how do we self-promote without coming across as trying to promote? Because we don't ever sell. We never talk about buy from me. We just more use it from a sort of behind the scenes, take a look at ourselves. We don't take ourselves very seriously. And, mm -hmm. and we're like, are we doing this the right way? Or are we doing this? Should we be doing something different? So what's your take on that whole sort of self-promotion versus narcissism? And can I just say too, like from, from the pedigree of what you do, you never come across as posturing, mm. which I find yeah. that, that we, we see a lot of posturing, a lot of, um, like you said, grandiose walking in, yeah. proclaiming you can do all the things when you can't actually do all the things. Yeah. I, you know, I, what you just said, Lisa, and I'll come back to, um, Devo, your question and first of all, I appreciate being here. Really uh, admire the work you do. I, I looked at you guys' backstory. I saw both of your businesses and how you guys merged together. I got to learn more about that story uh, on my show. So I'm always super humbled to be uh, in the room, even though virtual in this case. And you know, with two just great thinkers, and, and I know you guys are that, great executors of what you do, great thinkers and how you approach it. And so Lisa, actually what's interesting to Keep me, I think, <laughs> more. I think that more... <laughs> Keep going with her because it'll make up for you not doing the Valentine's thing. Is that it? <laughs> um, here's, here's the way I look at it. I got taught something early in my sales world in my 20s that I just absolutely, I just refused to accept. And it was called fake it until you make it. Mm -hmm. Right? When you're a youngster in your 20s and you're selling and you're into 
uh, a product or service that maybe you're not even the re- you're you've never been a customer of that product or service, and you're trying to sell into a marketplace. I'm in my 20s, and I'm selling into uh, a marketplace that I've never bought, I've never sold, and people are generally older than me. Um, one of the themes was fake it till you make it, and I wish that had changed in 30 years. But there's still a lot of fake it until you make it. Uh, one thing that's interesting about today's social media that is very eerily similar to my early years in real estate, in the real estate industry, was back in the early days of real estate, a lot of people would go and when they would order their business card, they would you had to choose your picture on the business card or no picture on the business card. And the people that chose to put a picture on the business card, they'd often go to a place, at least here in, in Las Vegas, and I don't know if it was a nationwide place, but it was called Glamour Photos, <laughs> right? Glamour Photos was a place where you could pay a couple hundred bucks, 300 bucks. I don't remember what it was because I never did it, but you could go get made up like you were a movie star and then have that photo be your photo on your business cards. Fast forward 30 years, 20 years, 30 years to where we now have Instagram feeds, which are perfectly postured, perfectly filtered, perfectly set up. Everything is beautiful. It's, 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 a microcosm of sort of this idea of as long as we present ourselves in a certain way, people will believe a certain thing about us and maybe not question actual, actually our ability to execute the actual thing that we say we can do. I, however, am a big believer in act as if versus fake it until you make it. What I mean by that is it's an underlying theme that has more to do with me internally believing and having confidence, ironic that I'm talking about this because I was just talking about when we don't believe in ourselves and how that can be the hindering crutch to our progress as entrepreneurs and as leaders and really parents, parenting and any of it. But I guess those were the two things that I thought about. Fake it until you make it. Back then, cell phones were those old brick cell phones, right? Them suckers were, I don't know how much they cost initially, but they were like $5 million a month. (laughs) <laughs> and they had these side holsters. <laughs> and when you put it to your ear, <laughs> you, like the old APD. It was, yeah, it was bigger than your head, right? And I got one. I couldn't afford it. <laughs> so I just was like, this is the dumbest idea. Nobody's calling me. I, I don't need it. Like a pager was fine. Uh, but but I think to your question, um, the this this self promotion versus narcissism. For me, it is important that we market our brand. I'm a marketer. I have no problem being it. I have no problem being a salesperson. I say that I've always been in sales, but I've never sold anything in my life. How does that work? And it comes to something we talked about uh, in in just offline conversations, and that is I've always viewed marketing, good marketing, as being helpful meaning whoever sees this could benefit in some way from the communication, whether they buy from me or not. And that's been a skill or a craft or an intention of marketing for me and and brands that I work with and how I coach people because it takes away the pressure of wondering how perfect is my newsfeed? How perfect is the image post? How perfect is this or that? And I mean, we may unpack this a little bit further, but it ties right into one other principle that I'll just say here and then we can go from it. And that is I learned that perfect is the enemy of done. Mm -hmm. And I got that, I believe, from Jim Collins. But he was the one where it was just like, we always are so critical about, is it right? Now, you guys are in the creative industry. So I'm, I'm preaching to the choir about what has to really look good. You two are fantastic at turning... Uh, still imagery into stories and turning video into stories and telling people stories through the video creative. You guys are amazing. I can't do what you do. So while I'm certainly not trying to lessen the idea of high quality output, I just learned that it's better and we can get results faster if we produce a thing with the best that we have available at the moment, because a lot of us procrastinate and kick things down the can. So I think, but this idea of narcissism and uh, you, Unfortunately, there are some people that purvey it um, and that fake it till you make it crowd is still out there. I heard, I first heard about the fake it till you make it through law of attraction. It was a, it's a concept that she, Abraham Hicks, are you familiar with this? 
Very much so. She talks about it a lot. I like the reframe because I don't actually like the word fake it until you make it. Yeah. Um, it, it feels disingenuous to me. Um, so, so in theory, uh, how I understand the term, you, you, the things that you want to become, the things that you want to have, the things that you want to be, I understand the mindset behind it you basically have to sort of pretend that you already have that. You have to pretend that you already have the big house, pretend that you already have the nice wardrobe, pretend that you have the really nice car. My problem with that is none of those things matter to me. I don't care about having a big house or a nice car, nice clothes. I'm more interested in, I know this sounds cliche, but I'm more interested in what's the experiences that I can partake in? What, what can I do around that space? And so the whole idea, well, and let me just reframe. I like money because money enables me to do cool things. Like Lisa and I like to travel and I like to buy nice things and I do have nice things. And so, but I like to have nicer things and we want to buy some properties and all those sorts of things. So I understand that it, there's the, a lot of things going on. Yeah. Things. <laughs> I like things. <laughs> well, I get it. Like I get the whole concept of money is, is the revenue and revenue is an energy and that's the commerce that we all live on. Right. So I get that. But the whole idea of pretending that I'm not somebody so that I can feel like I'm somebody just feels really disingenuous to me. And I, it doesn't, it's never sat well with me, even though I read it in every book that you can possibly imagine on manifesting your, your perfect life. It just sounds like, why would I do that? That just feels yeah. disingenuous. Yeah. I, I actually, I love, I love what you, you know, I like the analogy and, and how you bring up Esther Hicks because I'm, I'm not a massive student, a longtime follower of her work. But I, I'll share a thought that comes to mind when I think about what I hear her say, because I wasn't, I remember reading uh, or, or sorry, seeing the movie The Secret and just didn't get it. Oh wait, I just like what are they talking about? And so I'm, you know, so I don't want to go there. But here's what I've learned as I've matured because I also struggle with meditation. When I first started meditating, I, I just struggled with all of it. But to to your earlier comment of being learned, learned, I have spent time trying to uncover ways to feel better using, a, you know. Esther says that word a lot. I've always, I've become more mindful of how I feel. What I've noticed about the things that I've been able to acquire in my life, just like when you have the success through the economic metric that we call success, revenue, et cetera, I enjoy the things just as much as anyone else does. But I also realize that it doesn't change how I feel. And I want to feel as good as I possibly can in the acquisition process that would bring me the outcomes of those things. Meaning, you know, my, you know, my life partner and I, I, I hate to call her my girlfriend, but that seems crazy at 51, 52 to be saying girlfriend, but we've been together for 11 years. And it's interesting because she's massively excited the day that we put the trip on the calendar. We just put one on the calendar. She gets excited the minute we book the dates. I book the dates and then it goes on the calendar, just like any other event. When I get there, I become somebody different because I'm, I just don't know why that is, but it's, I just think it's different ways human beings process their level of excitement. So at times she can say, you're not really, you don't really want to go, do you? Oh, no, no, I want to go. Yeah, but you don't see that, you don't seem that excited. And it's just that I just recognize that it's an event in the future and I have to deal with a now today. And I live in now moments because I think all of us as entrepreneurs specifically, we have and leaders, and we have things that we have to do today that require us to be in a state of feeling today to, to produce that outcome or push that measurement forward. Um, but I'm like you, I'm, I'm much more of an experienced person. I'd rather spend a few hundred dollars on dinner than a few hundred dollars on a pair of shoes. Um, I dropped my suit wardrobe after I left the world of financial services many, many years ago. I got invited to a, a, a black tie thing, a black tie thing. And I rented a tux. I'm just, I'm not, I don't need one. I don't need them. I don't need five suits, 20 suits. I don't need custom made stuff. I'd rather take photos. I'd rather have those photos tell a story. And I think that comes back to marketing. If you think about it, um, as it relates to social media and how we promote ourselves, like what do you want people to feel when they come across you? I was just asked this the other day. Someone asked me, um, what, what is a non-negotiable core value for Daryl? And not just, it wasn't just in marketing or sales. It was about being in business and about in life. And it does apply across the board. And it's three words. It's positively impact lives. 
And what I mean by that is, and, and it took me a while to come down to that. It was actually, I want to say it was somebody who I saw on Instagram or, or not Instagram, Twitter years ago. He was, he was a big name influencer, but he's a good dude. Um, and he simply said, how would you describe your mission statement in three words? And I wrestled, I wrote it down and I wrestled with it and I wrestled with it and I wrestled with it. And I said, if I, if I just disappeared today and I asked this show on my, I asked this question on my show, if today was the last day that you were here on this planet, what would you want everybody to remember you for? And I think it comes down to those three words. It would be that, I don't know what it was about that guy, but I just seemed to feel a little bit better or I liked his energy after our interaction, whether that was a short interaction and we were just passing each other at the store. I talked to a Rams fan yesterday and it was, uh, sorry, San Francisco 49er <clears throat> fan yesterday before the game. And we just that. beat them. Baseball. <laughs> Lisa, that's Thanks, nice. Thanks baseball. for the tip. And, and so the interesting part about it is, I, I say this to say it, it could be a short inter interaction between two people who don't know each other, but I just don't want them to feel bad. Like, I don't want anyone to say and look at me at the, and say, man, I don't want to be around that guy. And I would just hope that if anybody said anything about me, it would be that, man, it's just when I was around him, I enjoyed the time for whatever that is. So for me, positively impact lives was one of those core values. And I think I just approached that in how I've done marketing and sales and business and team building. I, I know my team members are going to move on to other businesses and other companies. I mean, I've been fortunate. We've had six team members, I think, go on and start their own business from having gotten their training from us. And I'm all good with that. Like, it's my job as an entrepreneur to give people pathways. I'm my, not my job to give them a job that they should stay at forever. I just feel like, could it be a place where they feel positive about how our interaction was. So I, I'm, I don't want to go long winded on that, but that's just kind of maybe how I approach it. And I just don't get caught. I, yeah, I like metrics. Yes. I like analytics and I do the, yeah, I know all the numbers and yes, at the end of the day, when I'm getting paid and, and when we're getting paid to drive revenue, that stuff matters, but we also are super human in trying to say that we're still talking to a human being on the other side of whatever it is we're doing, product sales, product marketing, service sale, all of that. It's all just human to human. I love, I love everything you've said. I've, I've taken down all these notes. I'm sure we'll never get back to all these other points because we'll kind of like <laughs> open up all these other things, but we are all essentially selling, aren't we? It doesn't matter what area of our life we're in, whether we're actually entrepreneurs or, you know, working in a corporate situation, whether we're parents, whatever, we're always selling what what we believe to be right. And I, I love how you said act as if, you know, you've got a really calm, non-frantic demeanor. So when you're going into to any of these people that are taking you on to coach them, to train them, to help them with with what they need help with, how does that calm demeanor and that act as if, how does that translate over to them instead of being like a Gary V, you know, frantic sort of in your face sort of posturing instead? It's a great question. I just finished a call. And I think the simplest answer is, you, you said it before, I don't come across with having this posture, but it's not, it, I do have a posture because I'm clear about who an ideal client is for me. I'm clear about who an ideal customer is for our agency. And it's interesting. It's not just about how much revenue they make. It's not just about how long they've been in business. It's about the energy of the entrepreneur and their long-term intentions. And so for me, I don't have to get frantic in that I'm interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me. And we're really looking for a fit. You guys are in business and service industry, professional services like we are. And no one really wants to sign contracts. Like legally, we have to do that stuff to protect our businesses, but do they really protect our business? So I just told this gentleman who's interviewing three agencies, and I realize I'm one, my company's one of the three, there's nothing magical I can say to him. There's nothing magical. Like I've got a process, it might slightly different from another company's process, but he actually got to the heart of, of the matter. And he says, what I'm looking for is the right fit. And so when he said that, I'm thinking, so how do I not get frantic? Because I never try to sell the engagement. I try to answer the questions and help him, him or her see the pathway that we could take them on <clears throat> to help them reach their goal. So it, st it always starts with their goal. A lot of times I get on my first calls and I don't talk 
for 30, 35, 40 minutes. I just ask questions. I'm just a student of trying to pick their brain and figure out what brought them to the call. I have a process I call the high ticket selling model. And it's really just six questions. Like the first question is, is what brought you to this call with me today or with my company or whatever the case? And I just let them talk. And I'm trying to figure out where the problems lie in their world related to what it is that I can solve. And a lot of times those problems just bring up more questions. So I'm just an investigator. So I don't have to worry about selling because I'm not interested in selling. I'm interested in helping. And that's been the distinction for me for I don't know how many years. I realize I'm going to have to ask for the check at some point if I want them to be a client of mine and it seems like they want us to be the agency of record for them or if it's coaching or whatever it may be. But it's a discovery process and there's just certain things I can see. Now, I've had three such calls in the past week or two where as soon as the first call was over, there was no reason for a second call. And it wasn't because we're so good and they were so bad. It was their energy in the call and their unwillingness to be coachable and teachable against some past results that they had. And now they had an angle or a belief about the industry. Well, all you guys are. Well, every agency says this. And I'm like, if that's your attitude, I'm not sure I can serve you in the highest way. So I'm perfectly fine to end our call today and say that we're probably not a great fit and not let that become, I'm not desperate for business. I want more business just like anybody else. So I guess the posturing for me is I know what a good client looks like and it's not just the revenue or how many employees they have or how much their budget is even. It's about is this entrepreneur or the leadership team, are they at a place where they feel like they need to solve the problem and they value the help of expertise? And if they're not, then that could be a driving reason why we don't continue a dialogue. And that's what I also like to say. I like to say that I just take people through dialogues and we'll figure out if it's a good fit for us or not. If it takes us two conversations, great. If it takes us six, great. Uh, I tell this funny story. When I was in the real estate and lending industry way back in the day, I had one of these scenarios, 33 months, I had a prospective client who was on my books, who I would be following up with continuously um, over 33 months before they bought a home and before they got the mortgage from me. And someone would say, well, why do you keep calling them? And I was like, well, because they needed help and they needed help with credit issues. And they went, well, you don't get paid to do credit. And I'm like, yeah, I don't get paid to do credit, but they needed some help. <clears throat> Well, what did you do for them? I didn't do anything except give them some advice on how they could keep navigating to a better place where they would qualify for the home loan. Like, well, how, how many phone calls did you make? Well, it was a few. It was more than a few. But that's not the point, right? Because I was resourceful for them, they referred me six people in that 33 months. So I got paid. So I got paid to be helpful, but I didn't get paid from them directly. So I always say that when we are doing business, you get paid in multiple ways in everything you do. But a lot of people only think they get paid directly from their customer. And so I'm a big believer in client experience and lifetime value and return on relationships. So there's all sorts of ways to drive revenue. But a lot of people, the ones out there that may be doing the six-figure, seven-figure sales funnel, the, the hacks and all that stuff, they're chasing what I call, and even for, for those that believe or don't believe, I read the Bible. And to me, it's called fast money. And fast money goes away just as fast as it came in. Everything you said is sort of from a perspective of service first, serving others first before yourself. And at the core of that conversation, that idea of narcissism versus self-esteem or self-promotion versus narcissism sort of boils down to that. You ever, we, all, we all have that friend or that colleague that, and Lisa and I joke about this, but every time you, every time you hear Every time you have this conversation with somebody, you start to tell something about whatever it is you might have done or an experience you might have had. And before you can even finish, they start interjecting what they did about that story, right? We all know people like that. I know Lisa and I know the people like that. And you never, you don't actually get to finish what you were going to say, right? <clears throat> and so that person turns that about I. It, it, it's a conversation about I or about me. And so I think at the crux of what we do, because Lisa and I were talking about this and you're the same way. 
there's a way to promote yourself and have positive self-esteem around how good you are at what you do. But it's the framing and the juxtaposition at which you take when you talk about that. Are you talking about what I did? Or are you just telling a factual experience of what you did with someone else so that other people can see that right through their own context? I, and I, when I was... Sorry, one more point. When I was first thinking about how we could have this conversation and Lisa and I were talking and, I, and the, whole, the word narcissism pops up a lot for whatever reason. And so I looked up narcissism at the root of it and it's a, a Greek mythology. Narcissus is his name. And it comes from the fact that he, he would always just, whenever there was a reflection, he would stop for hours, whether it would be a, a, a puddle on the ground or a mirror nearby or a reflection in the water. And he would just sit there and stare at the water and just admire himself the entire time. And I was thinking about that because you see, and, and to each their own, and this is not a judgment, but people do what they do from their own context and their own delivery mechanism, right? And that's just who they are. But from my perspective, and certainly from Lisa's, because I know her better than anyone, you know, she doesn't take herself very seriously. She's very self-deprecating. But she's very good at what she does. And if you look at any of the delivery mechanisms in which she talks about her stories, it's never from like, hey, look how amazing I am. Look at this brilliant photograph I just created. It's all, it's, she's always positioning somebody else and shining the light on them. And in so doing, she's serving sort of like you do. But simultaneously, the viewer sees that and is like, well, we know by default that Lisa took that photo. And we know how Lisa made that person feel. So it's like, I want to work with Lisa. So that sort of roundabout way of being sure of what you are, knowing your value and your capabilities, it's almost unnecessary to talk about it from that context of like how good I am, right? And I'm reminded of this because I'm just going to embarrass Lisa. Lisa and I got in a little, argue, <clears throat> a little argument earlier this week. And, and the context doesn't really matter, but I found Conveniently my, right before Valentine's Day. That's yeah, why right. I didn't get any and flowers. I, <laughs> yeah, Airing your dirty laundry. Yeah, hello, it's planned out. <laughs> oh, fake, look, gotta go. fake it until you make it. <laughs> and I found myself sort of in the context of the conversation, which, by the way, was slightly taken out of context, Lisa. But <laughs> I, found myself having to I found myself having to defend my honor as if I had to show how, how proud I was of something I had done. And, you know, Lisa called me out on it like she always does. She always calls me out on my bullshit. And, you know, through self-reflection, I sort of realized the true value of what I do and the true value of what you do, Daryl, and the true value of what Lisa does and the true value of any entrepreneur, to be honest with you, is how we show up and serve others. And it doesn't really matter what we do because it's known by default that we're the creators of that in the first place because we're the ones who enable our client or our friend or our customer to sort of have the limelight, if you will. So um, the long and short of everything I just said is I think that it's because I had this conversation, by the way, Lisa, with my client beforehand. She's like, I don't know how to talk about myself. And but she's really good at what she does. And I'm like, social media is not necessarily your platform for you to be a narcissistic prick about things and stare at yourself in the reflection all day long. It's an opportunity for you to show up and share your value proposition with other people and show what you've done for the, the people that you've worked for and tell the yeah. stories about that. And in so doing, you're giving people sort of a pull back the curtain opportunity to just see how great you are. And it shines by itself when you, when you authentically talk about it from the context of not I, but a we concept. Does that make sense? So, I, yeah. I, love, I love that. Let me, let me throw one piece out that may help with... because So there's two things. Are you going to help you to stop being mad at me? I'll, no, do I <laughs> I'll do my best. I'll do my best. I think the only reason you're getting away with this is because you guys aren't in the same room. You're in Charlotte and she's elsewhere. She'd probably be punching you in the chin right now. No, no. He'd but be no. making dinner for me. I'd be fine. <laughs> oh, that's how he makes up? <laughs> he just does it all the time. So Two things that were interesting, right? And, and I, I think for anyone who is servant first leadership, like servant leadership, we've heard this phrase before. And I think that's where we draw the distinction. Some people get caught up in serve, 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 never make money. I teach people how to make money. Let's be clear about that. I don't, I don't back away from that. $300 million is where I had to stop the number. We were probably heading more towards half a billion. And that's because of rules with the FTC of us talking about it. So I can't talk about it. I can prove that much. I can't prove much else. So the reality is I'm in the business to help people drive revenue. I make no mistake about it. I'm unashamed about that. What I am interested though in thinking about is it is a it's really important for us to believe that we are the best in the business at what we do. Like that level of confidence, I think, Devo, to your point, doesn't necessarily have to show up 
in a braggadocious way, whether it's face to face with your client and sales interactions or on social media. What I think has to be there, though, is this internal confidence and belief. Like, I'm willing to go toe to toe with anyone in the world at what I do in terms of growing companies' revenues. Doesn't mean I'm going to win, but I have to be willing to get into that contest on Monday morning and say, if, there, if, if this is a, an opportunity to start from scratch and grow a business, the guy that I just spoke to an hour ago, he says to me, why are you interested in my company? Like, what, he, it was a fantastic question. Like, he's trying to vet us, we're vetting him. He's like, but why are you interested in my company? Like, is there anything interesting about what we're doing that your company's interested in? And I said to him, I says, I have no clue about your product. I don't know, to, it's being manufactured in India. I, I've just heard superficially what it is. I said, let me tell you what I am interested in. I'm interested in you as an entrepreneur. I'm interested in your vision for what you want to do with this company. I'm interested in what you've done over the last nine, 10 years. I'm interested in the certainty of where you are with the business. I'd rather partner with someone like that than someone who comes through the door telling me they want to go from a million dollars in revenue to 20 million next year. That's just unrealistic. What I mean by this idea of confidence and belief, I think we all have to have it. And I think when I say act as if, it's act as if you're in the place where you can serve this person at the highest level without it being, because otherwise you will lose business because that energy of disbelief and lack of confidence will show up in your sales interactions. It'll show up in your marketing. It'll show up in your context as well as your content. And you'll wonder why you're not closing as many prospects in the, in the world of business as you could. On the flip side. So, so flip what, side, you're, what you're talking about is self-confidence. I, I am, but it's, it, I am talking about self-confidence, but it's just a <laughs> distinction in the world because you, like you said, this idea of self-bragging, here's the other piece to this. When we're talking about social media, I think there is a way to demonstrate, which I think is what you, that's the word I use in my agency. How can we demonstrate our expertise? How can we show value without it being this I statement, to your point, D, mm -hmm. how can we make it a, here's how we helped, or here's how the process works. When I was just speaking with this guy, you know, he's like, well, Daryl, it doesn't sound like my company's as big as your agency wants to work with. I don't know where he got that from, but that's his own self-talk, right? Because he heard me talk about a couple of scenarios because he asked the question. So then he disqualified himself or he was trying to, and I simply was trying to drive a point of demonstrating how we've helped a couple of other companies that were in similar industries. So I think when you demonstrate without making it an I statement, right? I think that's a way to show up on social. Like you guys are visual uh, creators, right? You guys are visual creators, visual artists. When you put the, and Diva, you said it perfectly. You put the picture of the video with the story, right? Told from the customer's perspective, who can be mad at you? Who can, who, no one can take issue with that, right? If I tell the story of a client who was stuck at X dollar value and we got them to Y dollar value and I just tell the story and show some images and some charts, I don't even need a testimonial video because technically I'm just showing how the process worked uh, to help them get there. And so I just think that, again, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying this is the right way for everyone. I, I just see the same thing. And I talked to enough business owners in 11 years to know that they're getting caught up in the, what I believe is it was too good to be true. And you saw it and you fell for it anyway. Crap. I'm just over it for me in the digital marketing space. I'm just over it. And I wish we could put together some sort of professional association that just found a way to ban these folks, uh, get them out of the place. Because unfortunately you can go to udemy.com, nothing wrong with udemy.com and buy a course for 15 or $29 and literally lay a hat, uh, lay your hat, your shingle, and pretend to be an expert. And a business owner has no idea anything else other than that you figured out some of the vernacular uh, over the weekend. And I'm, I salute the person who decided to do that. But unfortunately, I hear too many stories where uh, business owners were so frustrated because they get, gave thousands and thousands of dollars away and didn't know the difference because it's easy to make it look like you know, that braggadocious thing is a piece of cake. Going back to the 90s, putting the glamour shot on your card and making it look like you drive a Mercedes Benz when you park around the corner. I, I'm telling you a real story. I remember somebody used to drive a little Nissan, I forget what it was called, little small Nissan, two-door two, two door 
thing. I think it turned into the Sentra later. And they would never park in front of their client's house because they dressed a certain part and looked a certain part. But if you saw them get out of the Nissan, you'd know they were fake. That's kind of the world that we're living in in this digital world. So I'll leave it at that. I think it's really important what you said, just learning the vernacular, because that is happening a lot more than we, oh. than we really realize in all sorts of industries that people come and they can kind of repeat things that they've heard, but they don't have the experience. And I think it's really, really important how intentional you are. You, you know, you've been talking about it a lot. It's not just that things have fallen into place for you. You've been very intentional about it and you're very intentional about vetting and um, just just having the right fit with who your client is, because that that intention that really demonstrates that alignment that you can make with them. And when Diva was saying ridiculous things about me, honestly, it's it's those relationships that you create with those people that you are aligned with that elevate you all, right? Yeah. And when you're yeah. you're intentional about that that alignment beforehand, before you partner with them, you're not wasting anybody's time. You're investing in your time and their time. And then that gives you that that confidence after because this is what you were able to do because you've aligned with them properly. It's not a quick sale. And it's a lot easier to make these relationships that last than selling, 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 selling. Like you said, by by putting that value in with that one client that you weren't necessarily getting that return on. That actually magnified many, many times over. And I just realized, and and I realized, I love the word intentional. I I appreciate you bringing that back up. I think the key is I recognize I get paid in more than one way, always. I never just get paid in cash or on a monthly retainer. I get paid multiple ways. To me, the value of my relationships over the last 25 to 30 years far exceeds the value of cash converted in a sales process. It It just does. You, we've met through, we have not met face to face. We've met through phone and, and Zoom. And the value of our connection, while it has not resulted in cash today, that wasn't a criteria of us getting together. But the fact that we have an opportunity to talk to each other, learn from each other, support each other as, as entrepreneurs who are thriving and who have similar minds, that there's, it's intangible to put that value on it. But I wanted to say one other thing about intentionality. And I think it runs through, if we use intention the way I've done it, is I'm intentional about my personal time as an entrepreneur. Like I'm not into the, I did it in my 30s, I'm not gonna lie. I did the hustle and grind, burn the midnight oil, I did it. I got to my 40s and I was like, this is, that that S is for the birds. Like I know this, I'm not going to do it. So I got intentional about my personal time. I got intentional about my health. I got intentional about my mind space. I got intentional about who we hired and who we didn't hire. I won't hire an employee that if I, a team member, by the way, that's intentional as well. I don't hire employees. I hire team members. And every now and then I have to catch myself because I'll say it every now and then. But the intention for me, having a boutique agency, which simply means we're not, we don't have a hundred people working for our company. You know, we between full-time, part-time, and contract, we're usually between 20 and 30. That's a small company. I just don't want people in my company who are just trying to collect a check, you know, because everything we do matters to our clients. So I just don't want someone who can just come into what it, maybe they're being a corporate. A corporate on a corporate employee who has this big infrastructure and they can kind of hide and float along and they're not really ambitious. No, I have a specific set of interview questions that we run our, our interview candidates through where we're looking for their intention. Like, what is their intention for coming to work with us? And there are a couple of things. I even said this uh, a few weeks ago to someone that the first interview, it's the same five questions to any candidate that comes to that first interview. And the moving on has nothing to do with their skills. It has nothing to do with their skills. So to your point, Lisa, about intentional, you can take intentionality to a lot of different places. So intentional about your personal life, intentional about your health, your well-being, your wellness, you guys are readers, Devo, you're a reader. Um, that's intentional. And that sets the tone. So acting as if isn't just this esoteric thing that you can decide to do and it's just going to manifest automatically. So Devo, I'm with you on this automatic manifestation. But no, you're going to then be led to the right books, the right connect- connections, the right seminars. That's what I've noticed in my journey of 30 years is that it's acting as if, well, if I'm not that person today and I need to become, then I think what does happen in the universe is it opens up doors and pathways for you to get the right connections, people, places, and things that you need to be associated with. 
that'll help you become that and build that level of self-confidence inside you. At least that's my experience. Or you can just hire yourself a good wingman that just follows you around everywhere you go and sort of just drops knowledge for you in advance. That's a good way. To I, don't, do it. I don't know anybody who does that. Um, we actually have we actually have people that do that though. Honestly, <laughs> if you think about the relationships that you've established with with your business counterparts, how many times do we get shout outs about and on social media as well about how great we are? They'll tag us. They'll say something great about us. They'll write us a Google review. Whatever it is, those are our wingmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were taking the jab at at, at uh, Mr. V. My bad. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were taking a jab at the having the videographer following. Oh, around. No, no. <laughs> gotcha. If, no, you're talking about your fans and your advocates and your past clients. Gotcha. No, if, if we could find somebody who was actually decent at what they do and wasn't going to break our bank account, we would have somebody following us around in every photo shoot because it's the stuff behind the scenes yeah. that my clients want to see. It's the stuff yeah. that that. You know, when I, whenever I can, I try to film for Lisa and vice versa, just so we can sort of show like we don't sell photography or videography. We sell the badass experience that we provide for our clients and we want everyone else to see that. And, and when we do see it, it's usually in a sort of a self-deprecating wingman capacity. It's not like yeah. I'm not sitting up there staring at myself in the mirror, guys. Hey, uh, you know, hold on, let me take this call right now. Type of approach. Just like, <laughs> well, I'm, it- I'm sorry, go ahead, Luke. I was, I was going to say it'd be interesting to see Daryl as well in his flow state when he doesn't even realize what mm-hmm. he's doing. He's just in that state doing it and, and giving value. It'd be yeah. interesting to have that behind the scenes as well. Yeah, it is interesting, right? I've I've never really been the personal branding guy. I'm I'm starting to move away from that because I've always been kind of a data and analytics guy and a human behavior guy. And yeah, I've been edged, moved, pushed, if you will, to move towards personal branding, which sort of started with the podcast. I don't know what that looks like. It is interesting. I've listened to a couple of podcasts I've been on. I started doing that recently. And I even told some people on my team and I was like, I don't even remember where I got that statistic from. Like to this minute, I said something so fluidly in this conversation and I cited a statistic from 2002 and I'm thinking, where in the heck did I get that from? It's true. But in the moment, it's like, to your point, Lisa, of this idea of flow, I just think we've, we've packed pieces of who we are and our expertise in little pockets of drawers in our brain, little pockets where we can access it when we need to. Um, and it, it was actually interesting because I was listening. I'm like, I sounded a, a narcissist. <laughs> I, I'm <I> amazing. <laughs> I sounded really good. I was like, <laughs> I'm shocked. Devo like, never listens to his podcast. Like, I have to listen to them after. And he's like, well, how was it? I'm like, well, this was good. This we could improve on, but he will not listen to them. He's just no, not I into just, any of that. I never, I never really did it, but I started to, um, I, I wanted to, so I'm, I'm a, I am going to write a book. See, I almost said the word that I'm, I need to stop. I almost said the word with a T. I'm going to write a book. Someone recommended that will, since you've been podcasting, for the last two and a half years. And since you've been starting to be on other people's podcasts, why don't you get all the transcripts and start looking for the themes? And I was like, great idea. But then I saw all that text and I'm like, that's garbage. Like, I'm not reading all that. So I started, right? So I took the next best thing, which is, okay, I'll pop one of my own shows in my head while I'm at the gym. So I'll listen to something I've said and start, I'm trying to find the themes. Now I kind of know what the themes are if I write them down, but you know that recall when you're, doing something that you're normally not good at because you said you're going to do it and you're not in flow state. So I'm trying to figure out where these themes are that I've been continuously talking about to your point of flow, because it is interesting because I'm like, I said that it's actually true, but I didn't even remember being asked that question. So it's kind of funny, Mm -hmm. kind of weird. Well, the, the whole thing about narcissism um, for me has always been a compelling conversation because I grew up, around some narcissistic people. But I was thinking about this, Lisa, and I, I've said this to you before, and since it's Valentine's Day, I'll, I'll just say it again. When I first met Lisa five years ago, I saw her on Instagram. And one of the things that was, and I, I say this not from necessarily a romantic perspective, but was attracted, was attractive about Lisa is that she sort of had this sort of charming, witty, self-deprecating demeanor about herself. 
And I was like, who is this woman that's basically talking shit about herself, making fun of herself in all the context of what she's delivering, yet has these ridiculous photographs everywhere and the things that she was doing and the experiences that she was having. So the proof is in the pudding. You don't have to be staring at yourself in your reflection all day long. If you can just present your story, if you can present your truth, and people are, and people are smart. You know how smart consumers are. They can see right through your bullshit. So right. I think it's all about the delivery and the context in which you show up. I would, does anybody disagree with that? Not at all. And, and it's the word that everybody doesn't want to hear. I, you, every, no one wants to hear your authentic self, but it's true. I know it's overplayed, but listen, at the end of the day, some are for you and some won't be for you. The mm -hmm. faster we can, and it doesn't mean we can't be friends. It just means it, it's a clarity, right? But I think someone's going to be attracted Look, I used to make jokes. I've got a hat on right now, but you know, I have a bald head. And I'm like, someone may not care just because I have a bald head. And that's okay. That's their, that's their preference. No big deal. Um, it, it's, I think it's just being 100% you. Because when you try to be anything but you, you feel it. And it's you know exhausting. It. It's tiring. <laughs> it's for crying out loud. It's the worst thing. On a, you try it for a little while if you've never tried it, if you're listening to this. Don't try it. Just be you. The problem is we talk so bad about ourselves. And here's the problem. There's a difference between being having humility and and I I know what you I I doubt Lisa was really self-deprecating herself in the truest sense of it, but I think she was also approached. She was a pro I'm making this up because I can't know what you saw. I'm, I'm actually a pretty confident person. It was it's that's just, what yeah. that's where I was going. Yeah. Right. You were just trying to to tell stories from a standpoint of awareness. Oh I yeah, she was telling shit about herself. She was yeah. being funny and self-deprecating. That's a big difference, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that a lot of people pick that up. You know, um, one of the questions, just a funny one I ask when people come to work my agency is, um, tell, me, tell me three things, not one. Tell me three things you absolutely suck at. And I don't want it to necessarily be about the job that they're, they're applying for. I mean, just in, in general, what do you... In, you go out, what are you really, you're just horrible at. And it's interesting because what I'm trying to get at is trying to figure out how much self-awareness do they have, right? It's one thing to be impressive for a job interview. So I try to cut through all of that extra. I'm going to try to get my questions and answers all right. So I know they're going to ask this because I know I was asked. No, I don't want to hear all that. What are you, are you self-aware of what you're not good at? And a lot of times I have to tell them what I'm not good at before they actually open themselves up and realize it's not going to hurt their interview. It's just a question of self-awareness. And I think when we can be self-aware of our strengths and weaknesses, and we can tell people we're working on something, or we can share vulnerability, you know, we've all got stories. None of us are perfect. None of us have had this life go, uh, quote unquote, textbook. But at the end of the day, I think it went, quote unquote, textbook. Because none of us, you know, knew what this was going to be. No one knew what our life journey was going to be. Heck, I'm not doing anything I thought I was going to do 30 years ago. I'm so far away from what I thought I was going to do when I went to college. I mean, all of us have taken different trips in life. So I think everything has presented itself the way it needs to be. And us accepting that and being okay with it is that level of self-awareness that I think I'm looking for when I'm working with someone. Like I said, this guy I talked to an hour or so ago, he's so crystal clear. He's like, Daryl, I want to grow, but I like my life. And I said, tell me what that means. And he described it. And I was like, I appreciate that. The fact that you're that clear. And he's basically saying, this may not make us a good fit, but this is where I'm at. And I said, because of that clarity, I can see us being a good fit, right? It's the randomness of people trying to be something they're not is where, where <laughs> you know, I can't coach anybody like that, right? But if you tell me you want to move at a 20 mile an hour pace, great. And if you have the infrastructure to move at 180 miles an hour, great. But as long as we're clear on that, I think we can serve each, we, we can be a, we can be a good uh, value.